First of all, a big warm welcome to Peter Murray. Um, we're very privileged to have him here. Um, so it's a talk of the valley and, and, and the city. Um, Peter's an architect by trade. Um, he was an editor as well of the RMBA Journal um, and building, building design. Building design, yes. Yeah, building yeah. design. Um, and you even founded Blueprint, I gather, I did, which yeah. is fantastic. Um, he's now the chair of, of New London Architecture. And we are also a partner in that. We do all sorts of things with, with that organization. I think we're a sort of partner, partner. But we also, some of our people have also spoken uh, there quite a few times. And we've done some initiatives together, such as Healthy Cities. So it's really good to, to work on that partnership and, uh, and have Peter here. So he's going to be talking about, about planning in the city. And this is really the culmination day of our week-long Cities Festival, which has been the first one we've ever done. Um, it's been UK focused, but it's been fantastic. We started off with a webinar which told, shared where we we're going in terms of cities, the kind of areas and projects that we really are doing and want to be doing. Um, we then had webinars on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday on debates such as should London be a, um, a, a national park? Um, should we rebalance the UK through its cities and its heritage holding cities back? So it's been really fantastic and lots of people have joined on that Twitter. So today is the culmination of that Cities Festival, which is absolutely great. Now, this is, um, today we're in the middle of the holidays and it's Friday, so we didn't expect a huge audience in presence, but we did want to beam it around the country which is what we are doing, but we're also recording it because we know many people can't come today and we want to make sure as well that people across the globe can share in this as well. And in fact, next year, we really plan to make to go global with this um, so that we have an Atkins Global Cities Festival. So this has been a fantastic pilot. Now, the person who's so responsible for helping to organise this is Zoe. Zoe Green, our ITPI and planner of the year, very famous. Um, and I just want to say thank you very much to Zoe because she's done so much to organise this festival and make it a success. And I am going to ask Zoe to chair questions to Peter at the end of his talk. So Peter's going to talk to us about, about planning in the city, but I'm not going to say what the title is because it looks quite difficult to pronounce. Right, <laughs> so I think we'll let Peter talk and do his thing and then we'll go on to questions at the end. So over to you, Peter. Thank you very much. Um, right, yes, the apotheosis of incremental pragmatism is the uh, title of my talk because it is about uh, planning, but it's also about decision making, how decisions get made in cities. And London has a very specific sort of DNA of the way things are done, and a DNA which has been shifting in recent years with an elected mayor. And I have to say, to people in Bristol, I, or I trained at the Royal West of England Academy School of Architecture in Bristol and uh, always found it a great city and very encouraged that they now have an architect as a mayor of the city and looking for great things in terms of uh, improving public space, getting rid of cars and uh, getting taking Bristol back to the wonderful city it was before um, the car took over and it's one of my views about cities generally, but I shan't be talking about that because once I get on that high horse, uh, then there's no stopping. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, experiences uh, that we've had recently surrounding the debate about tall buildings, because that actually has a huge number of lessons to London and I think other cities around the world about decision making, how you actually future proof, how you look at uh, existing cities, how you adapt them for the future and how you adapt them for growth. And so a little bit of background at the moment. I'm the chairman of New London Architecture, which I hope all London people are aware of. Uh, people outside London may not be quite so aware of, but it is uh, a centre for debate and discussion about issues to do with London and our main sort of attraction to uh, overseas visitors and to local people wanting to see what's happening to their city is our large model of central London, which shows uh, new buildings on it as well as the existing uh, infrastructure and it's probably the best way to see how untidy uh, London is as a city. Uh, it is planned in places but fundamentally London was a city that happened uh, by because of its topography, because of accident, because of accidents that happened to it and uh, through a whole series of decisions which uh, I'll look at as, as we go through. 
and we have a regular uh, series of talks and discussions and uh, people speaking. So here's uh, Richard Rogers with Jan Gale, uh, which was uh, one of the highlights of our program a year or so ago. So we have exhibitions, uh, a temporary exhibition space where we show uh, what's happening in London. And as I say, our Tall Buildings exhibition, which happened in April this year and had a major impact on uh, the debate about London, uh, was one of those temporary exhibitions. Now, of course, looking at London uh, uh, at the moment, we have to be aware that we're dealing with growth. For a lot of the time I've been living in London, uh, London's population was reducing, it was getting smaller, and investment was uh, difficult in infrastructure, and generally it was, uh, uh, there were lots of rather depressing things about uh, how London was evolving as a city, but that has all changed in the last decade, and it's changing even faster now. And changing in a way, again, which is rather accidental, because uh, the uh, demographers who actually thought uh, about these things got asked the statistics totally wrong as to uh, you know, what was about to happen in London. And they even changed. Uh, this is the difference between the GLA uh, suggested population, their calculation 2011, you get the, they recalculate 2012 for the latest uh, changes to the London plan. And you can see, you know, the, there's half a million uh, difference uh, to the numbers they're expecting uh, just by 2030. Uh, so actually, planning is quite difficult to do in that sort of situation. We don't know quite what's happening. We know there is growth, uh, but uh, uh, the uh, figures seem to change quite dramatically and at the moment uh, we are having to uh, face a shortage of something like 90,000 primary school places uh, by 2016 which is because they didn't get their figures right. It seems fairly amazing that actually you, you, you can't work out what the uh, right figures are it just uh, two years ahead. But that is the sort of situation we face which requires a certain pragmatic response to uh, the situation each time the mayor rewrites the London plan. And of course, one of the key elements of the London plan is, as a part of Richard Rogers' compact city ideas that uh, went into the Urban Task Force report uh, under the uh, last Labour government, and then was also absorbed largely into the London plan, all uh, development for London, at least for the time being, and that will probably change, but at the time being, all development for London takes place within the Greater London area. And then around that, we of course have, have the Green Belt, which uh, uh, creates a very real constriction to the ability of London to grow in the outer suburbs. Um, uh, a Green Belt, which is actually, it's only when you see a picture like this, you realize how huge it is. Now, if that was all rolling countryside and a sort of like a national park, uh, uh, all well and good. But actually, if you go out to the Green Belt, there are a few very nice uh, bits of it, but there are also uh, huge areas of very grotty bits to it, which certainly aren't very green, and uh, do not really live up to the sort of picture of the uh, CPRE and uh, the Tory backwoodsmen who would protect the uh, Green Belt at any cost. And that is going to become, uh, uh, over the next couple of years, I think it's going to be a significant debate about the Green Belt. And it, looking at London, they, my feeling is that it seems totally out of scale for the things that we need to do in terms of creating a lung for London, uh, creating uh, a belt that actually stops sprawl, which is a good thing, but it doesn't need to be uh, three times the size of the capital itself. But of course, how, how, how does the... Uh, may deal with that uh, growth in the short term, and a lot of uh, the growth is going to happen in these opportunity areas, and there's 33 opportunity areas around London where uh, growth and increased density is encouraged, that uh, they are areas which have good public transport uh, connections, and uh, we're going to see in those areas a fundamental change to uh, what London looks and feels like. And that seems to be one of the key parts of the debate that we face today. But to understand how, how London works, you really have to go back to uh, uh, the uh, London of, uh, this is medieval London, but the 
the Romans arrived in London, they, they created, it, they put it where it was because it's next to the river, um, good access right, from Rome, but also it was the first place that they could cross. It was also reasonably inland so it could be protected from marauding pirates and people like that. So actually in the uh, 13th, 14th, 15th century it grew up into a major trading port um, with, as you can see, standard sort of medieval city plan, close grey, small houses, most of them in wood, streets so narrow that of course when it caught fire, um, they, uh, it all caught fire and as you all know, 1666, um, London burnt to sticks and uh, in, uh, of course, 1616, it'll be the 450th anniversary of the Great Fire of London, so uh, there'll be lots going on around that then, but um, the interesting thing about uh, that were well, there were two things. One, building regulations. You know, the first building regulations came out of that, that uh, uh, we uh, had to build everything a brick, King Charles said, because uh, then it wouldn't catch fire quite so easily. Uh, we widened the streets uh, a bit, and uh, you had uh, you know, three types of houses, basically, you, you could choose from uh, small, medium, and large. And uh, those houses with uh, pretty standard plans, um, standard frontages, uh, became uh, the classic London terrace house, which actually formed you know, the, the basic shape of London up until the uh, Victorian period when things got a bit more exotic. Um, but uh, you know, the building regulations uh, created uh, the form of uh, the city, but uh, immediately after the fire, of course, Christopher Wren came up with the idea of a plan uh, for the place uh, uh, that would have large streets, uh, views, so there'd be a grand arcade up to uh, St Paul's Cathedral, and it would be more like uh, Paris or continental cities in the classical tradition. But uh, London you know, was a mercantile city, and the merchants there didn't want to hang around uh, for years while they, they came up with a new plan, and they insisted on getting back to work as soon as they could, rebuilding their premises, on exactly the same plots with slightly wider street frontages that they had uh, before the fire. So what happened was then London was rebuilt um, on essentially a med medieval street pattern which you go to the city today and is still there in many parts. And the really fascinating thing though is if you go look at the uh, city engineers report in 1944 where they were recommending how they should uh, rebuild London after the Brits uh, they uh, said exactly the same thing, that uh, you know, we need to uh, rebuild it as it was before, same plots without major change. And actually the only thing that really changed the shape of the city in the post-war period were, was the um, enthusiasm of a couple of people from uh, Jones Lang Wooden as they were then, who actually realised that they could pick up really cheap sites that had been bombed and nobody wanted to work much in the city and they started uh, uh, amassing uh, some of the sites, larger sites, which were then redeveloped after the war, and uh, we'll uh, see a couple of those in a minute. Now, uh, so that, you know, there was no plan. It wasn't a plan. It happened because there were certain people on the ground at the time, they responded to uh, the situation as they found it. So uh, th this, this was the city of London um, after the Blitz, you know, which is a pretty bleak prospect, and you can imagine if you go out and offered somebody a few quid for their site, they might say, uh, glad to get rid of it. Of course, uh, now it's all very different. Uh, and uh, you could see that all these purple bits are where uh, bombs fell and areas were destroyed. This is largely the area of the Barbican. The Barbican uh, area was then mainly warehouses and they uh, stored soft furnishings for the uh, large department stores of the West End, and of course when incendiary bombs dropped on them, the whole lot went up, leaving a very convenient large site for Chamberlain, Powell and Bond to design um, Golden Lane and the Barbican. And at the time of uh, reconstruction after that, the, the City of London followed a lot of the ideas that were uh, about real planning. You know, you, you had Buchanan 
writing uh, reports about how do you deal with traffic in towns and particularly traffic in central London, where uh, you know, cars were given the, the whole of the ground space virtually. I think this image is actually just sort of down there somewhere in the middle of Fitzrovia. So can you imagine Charlotte Street, you know, eating out in Eleanor's or somewhere like that? Uh, that wouldn't happen today. You would be um, up here somewhere. And uh, that actually um, happened in the city. The, the, the pedway through the city, which you can still find in Barbican, uh, was, uh, went right the way through the city and up until about 1992, if you put in a planning application for an office in the City of London, uh, you actually had to uh, release the uh, first floor so that they could uh, put the pedway through it. Um, it Realised it, it didn't work. So this was a piece of planning that lasted for um, about 25 years until just the general sort of uh, unwillingness of people to use it uh, uh, just uh, meant that it had to be dropped. So again, you know, where we do grand planning, uh, the public reaction is so strong against it that uh, it, it's gotten rid of. And actually even London Wall in the city, which is uh, currently a four-lane uh, dual carriageway where you can race along for about 250 metres before you halt at uh, Moorgate, uh, that also is going to be uh, gotten rid of and turned into a uh, two-way uh, street uh, with greater pedestrian and cycle usage. So even those areas um, that uh, where we put in planning, uh, they disappear. And th this is uh, Bucklersbury House, which was built uh, after the war, and this is exactly one of those uh, uh, sites that was put together by uh, enthusiastic young surveyors from Jones Lang uh, Wooden, and uh, they uh, put a, a, a put the site together and then sold it to Legal and General, who developed it into a large office block. As you can see, a very ugly office block, which nobody liked at all, not very well built, totally unfit for a 21st century occupation, and uh, therefore ideal uh, to uh, demolish and build something new. Because, of course, one of the great things about the city is the reason why it's managed to uh, maintain itself as a centre for business. As I say, it has a medieval street plan, yet it is, of course, the financial capital of the world. Bizarre, you know, leading uh, digital uh, 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 business carried out in a 15th century uh, environment, but the fire demolished a lot of buildings, allowed it to rebuild itself again. Victorian period, nobody liked the Georgian stuff, they knocked it all down, they re rebuilt two thirds of the city, and then of course after the um, uh, Blitz, then there were lots of sites which could be uh, redeveloped. As I say, they weren't redeveloped very well, so they, these are all easy to knock down. And if you look at all the new buildings that have been put in the city, most of them are built on uh, uh, the sites of 1950s and 60s buildings which were demolished. The problem in the city is all that quite nice Edwardian uh, stone, Portland stone buildings, which nobody wants to um, knock down and has to be very expensively uh, renovated to make them uh, possible for use. And actually, the city is very worried now that, of course, uh, they've been having a policy of world-class architecture for the last decade. And uh, so uh, now that the Lloyds building is uh, listed, uh, you can be absolutely certain within about 20 years, the uh, Swiss rebuilding, the Gherkin, will be listed, as I'm sure in another 30 years or so will the Leadenhall building. So one of the few spots that they have for redeveloping the city uh, will then be placed in aspect. And I think this was one of the issues which you've been tweeting about uh, during the week. What does uh, all this new architecture mean to the ability of the city to uh, reflect the need for growth and change and change in technology? And of course, in 1986, uh, we had uh, Big Bang, and uh, that meant that uh, hundreds of uh, banks from around the world, particularly American banks, came to London looking for buildings with large floor plates, uh, first of all, and also uh, large floor to ceiling heights so that they could fit in all their uh, communications equipment. Uh, the problem, of course, uh, the, the city was too constrained in the outside, so this is Broadgate, 
which was uh, built on the site of the old Broad Street station and on the air rights of Liverpool Street, creating uh, some space on the uh, fringes of the city. But then uh, somebody from CS First Boston had the bright idea that they could actually build uh, uh, stuff out in the docks, and this is Canary Wharf as it was in about uh, 1968 or 9, and uh, this again is one of those great accidents of uh, British decision making, that basically uh, this was created into an enterprise zone, enterprise zone was set up by the Thatcher government to provide uh, tax breaks, lower rates and a light touch planning system. And uh, the uh, London's Development, uh, Docklands Development Corporation, who looked after this area, um, thought that you know the idea of what they really do is to put tin sheds over here. This is what wants sort of low-rise stuff, uh, light industrial. Uh, maybe uh, you might have the old film studio there. Um, uh, people who could uh, uh, logistics companies, that sort of thing. Very low-rise. So um, Michael von Klam uh, from CS First Boston. Uh, uh, came out here with his uh, developer chum, G-Ware Travelstead, and they thought this would make actually quite a good place for a back office for CS First Boston, and then they looked at it a bit more, and they already had problems finding the right sort of space they needed in the city of London, and they thought we could actually turn this into a financial centre, because all those American banks who are coming to uh, uh, London they want somewhere to be, and you know, they, they want somewhere that looks a bit like America, really. And it's, I think it's fascinating as a reflection, again, this accidental aspect of London. This is, this is the equivalent uh, uh, to uh, modern London that you know, Chinatown is to um, Soho, in that uh, you know, this reflects the uh, influx of a whole culture which... Uh, we had not had before. It's a North American culture. They were bankers. Uh, they uh, had uh, uh, gridded streets. Um, they have orthogonal buildings. And uh, they uh, do things very fast. But, uh, this is now uh, Canary Wharf, just about as it is today, only sort of 25 years or so, uh, so after they got going. And they, of course, as you probably read, they got the planning permission uh, behind there for Wood Wharf for a whole series of other buildings which will be going up over the next decade. Of course, you know, this is a fundamental change to the area. When the docks uh, went, uh, they lost uh, 100,000 jobs, and uh, jobs were leaching also out of the manufacturing industry in the uh, East End over to China. I always get a laugh when I tell that to the Chinese visitors who would come to our model and I give them a tour and I tell them why the east of London is actually the poorest part of the city and why if you live in the east end uh, you actually lose a year of your life expectancy for every tube stop uh, going east. And uh, so uh, the Canary Wharf moved in. They have now, uh, they now employ some 110,000 people in uh, Canary Wharf alone, plus, of course, many others who are employed in related industries in the surrounding area. Um, although you still feel, and uh, again, on our model, you, it looks very plainly the case that it is an island within an area that uh, still needs massive uh, investment and ma massive new infrastructure. But it is fundamentally a very different piece of London than uh, anything else. And the city then needed to respond because uh, what happened in the uh, uh, late 90s was a lot of decision making going on in the boardrooms of banks like Deutsche Bank as to where they ought to locate their HQ. And they were looking at Paris, they were looking at Frankfurt, and they were looking at the city. And the city had uh, traditionally been quite difficult to uh, uh, develop in, rather more conservation minded. Uh, Peter Rees, uh, uh, denies uh, this absolutely, but uh, I have it on paper because I interviewed him um, in, in 1997 for a state's times that he's always supported the idea of tall buildings. He didn't, he was dead against them up until uh, Frankfurt published a master plan which showed a whole series of towers on its skyline. 24 new towers in order that uh, 
uh, Frankfurt could accommodate the demand from the international financial market. And uh, almost overnight, the uh, city turned a somersault and decided that actually uh, tall buildings in certain areas might be a good thing. And the first out of stocks was this, which was the uh, London Millennium Tower designed by Norman Foster for uh, Caverna, uh, who were a Swedish uh, company but had uh, just taken over Trafalgar House, major uh, developers at the time. And uh, I've never quite understood why they went for this, but I think uh, it's clear there must have been a stalking horse because uh, they say, well, if you show something really big, totally out of scale, and then you come along with something a little bit more in scale, people say, phew, all right, let's do that. <laughs> and so that was the case because the site of this had been where the IRA bomb had been, the Baltic Exchange, very difficult to uh, develop it because English heritage were insistent that the Baltic Exchange, which was then just in pieces, uh, it should be put back together again and any development should happen on the top. Uh, various exercises, largely by GMW, showed that uh, that was really pretty difficult to deliver. And so they uh, very brilliantly got Norman Foster to, uh, uh, or Ken Shuttleworth, I don't know, whichever you think it was, uh, to come up with uh, a, a building that I think has actually revolutionized uh, people's attitudes to tall buildings generally. But also it was uh, an elegance and I think uh, quality design that convinced the uh, uh, chairman of English Heritage, Jocelyn Stevens at the time, that they should support this as opposed to the restoration of the Baltic Exchange. And so with English Heritage behind it, it had a pretty fair win. Same height as uh, Tower 42 or the NatWest building as it was then, and a, a building that has been uh, universally popular and uh, therefore I think has uh, greatly assisted the acceptance of uh, a whole series of other buildings that uh, are now uh, beginning to make up the uh, city's skyline. Of course, the, uh, the pinnacle here in the middle of that is still undergoing a few uh, development problems. There seems to be some uh, lack of ability to agree between the funding partners at the moment as quite what they do, but uh, no doubt that will uh, get going as the city uh, picks up. But uh, the city uh, stopped almost all of the towers, apart from the Heron Tower and the Broadgate Tower, in 2007-2008 at the time of the uh, financial crash. But then uh, two of them came back on fairly quickly back in 2011, partly because the insurance market in the city was not as affected as everyone thought it might be by uh, the downturn. And uh, so both these buildings are now, although they're not even, uh, well, I think that got flat practical completion last week. Um, they are now about two thirds left. So uh, there are uh, all the stories about empty office blocks uh, is not uh, true anymore. And uh, this is uh, really sort of changing the shape of the city and changing it in a way which I think in many ways is very positive. I mean, I, I like this building anyway, but also uh, the way that it's treated at the ground plane with. Uh, which connects into a whole series of other spaces which are being delivered by the other tall buildings in the Eastern Cluster, uh, a six uh, floor high atrium and public accessible ground plane. I think it is a very uh, positive piece of city planning. Um, city planning which of course is determined by where you can't put tall buildings and this is, these are all the protected view corridors in, in, within which you, you are unable to build. But that means that uh, you, you find in places like Bishopsgate, which has just announced uh, a new master plan for consultation, you get uh, places where you can build tall buildings and then a great rift uh, where you sink down to heights that are acceptable by the view management uh, regulations. But in our survey of tall buildings which are proposed for London, we, came, uh, we, we, we counted up uh, about 237 uh, buildings that are still under construction, have planning, or are in the system, and uh, these are a few of them. And uh, a lot of them, as I say, more acceptable now because uh, the general public, they liked uh, the Gherkin, they liked the Shard, and therefore they're looking to positive pieces of architecture, not necessarily to iconic, but positive pieces of architecture, 
um, instead of the sort of concrete monstrosities of the uh, 1960s. And so these are some of the buildings, some I think uh, uh, not, not that great, uh, some quite elegant, but all of them and it's failing, or not all of them, many of them failing to address how they relate to other buildings in the city and other parts of their area. And as you can see, and I think this is a great criticism of uh, the, uh, what I think uh, when I speak to architects about it, they say the client doesn't want it, so uh, that uh, no, these are all uh, drawn without anybody, any neighbours in sight at all. Yet almost all of them will actually uh, be, be parts of clusters. And clusters are one of the key things which are going to define the uh, London skyline over the next few years, as long as we go on building tall buildings, of course. And I, I do think that uh, uh, there is enough public mom momentum for tall buildings these days. Uh, the, the, the public are not against them in the way that I think they were a decade or so ago. Uh, but we will see this major shift in uh, groups, because you know, this building was built at the junction of Tottenham Court Road and Euston Road because that was a major part, uh, it was a marker of a key junction in the city. Uh, just as Tottenham Court Road uh, had centre point and Marble Arch had uh, the Marble Arch Tower there with the cinema, in, these were seen as focal points of the city and these towers were landmarks. Now, uh, we, the idea of the landmark continued uh, up until fairly recently because you have this building here which is the Vauxhall Tower right to the east end of the Nine Elms uh, Opportunity Area and uh, this was uh, permitted by uh, John Prescott when he was Deputy Prime Minister it had been turned down by Lambeth, turned down uh, by his uh, inspector but approved uh, by John Prescott because he thought uh, what he wanted from architects was the wire factor so that's what architects for provide a wire factor, and he thought this would provide a wire factor at the end of uh, the uh, uh, corner of the Thames here, and it would be a landmark building which actually marked the passage of the river through the city. But of course now, in the changing environment where we realise London is grown, we have to provide more accommodation, what was a landmark, individual landmark, single object, now becomes the sort of queen bee uh, that uh, generates a cluster around it, that then will uh, create a very different uh, picture of uh, the city. So if you look at uh, what is happening to London at the moment, this is uh, Skyland in 2006, if you had uh, been going across uh, Waterloo Bridge, this is the view you would had, um, uh, two uh, sort of 1970s towers, quite big towers on the river, say landmarks uh, illustrating the curve on the river, and uh, just a, a couple of towers, the Gherkin and the NatWest uh, building on the skyline of the city, with Canary Wharf way in the distance, with just three towers. Now, move forward to uh, 2020, and you see a very different uh, shape to the city. Doom Tower here. This building's still there, but I bet somebody's going to add a few floors onto that fairly soon. Uh, this is the old IPC office building, now being turned into residential uh, by KPF with a, uh, about 15 more floors on the top. Uh, Ian Simpson's uh, building there with a whole cluster hidden behind it as well and the shard further back and then uh, the uh, City of London there. So um, you know, these are fundamental changes in the way that London will look and they are changes that actually... Um, I'd say until uh, we uh, did our exhibition, most people weren't aware of. Uh, because all these things happen in local boroughs. You know, London's got 33 boroughs, they all do their own thing. And uh, uh, they, each individual building has plenty of consultation around it, but nobody put the whole uh, picture together. And you get things like this. Now, I mean, this is a, a sort of car crash of the first water, really. Uh, this is uh, looking from Greenwich towards Canary Wharf, and this is Canary Wharf uh, uh, as it is at the moment, and there is an axis which was determined by uh, planners uh, some time ago uh, uh, that uh, uh, would have an impact on the layout of Canary Wharf because that is the axis that then goes back into uh, through the Queen's House and uh, the uh, Royal Naval College. So an important line. And 
At the moment, uh, there are proposals for this number of towers, which would go on South Quay mainly, which is to the south of Canary Wharf. The thing interesting there is that Canary Wharf is under single ownership, is a planned environment, so the, uh, it, 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 and it's laid out in a certain way, and then they generally build it as it's laid out. I mean, that's sort of what planning is, really. And, uh, but here, this is uh, now in South Key, that's all multiple ownership. You've got about 25 different uh, developers, all uh, you know, paid a lot of money for a bit of uh, land, on which they hope they can put a, a 63-story tower. Now, um, that sort of doesn't work, really, because you, you, you can't put uh, you know, too many 63-story towers next to each other. Um, and so somebody's got to work out how you actually deliver a working piece of city with all those conflicts. And McCrane and Abington have been now commissioned by Tower Hamlets to try and uh, sort of knock this into shape. But as somebody said, it's, you know, it's 25 years too late. All these bits of land they've been, they've been bought, the infrastructure is basically there, DLR, all that sort of stuff, not much you can do to that, um, without vast expense, which Tower Hamlets probably haven't got. Um, nobody no quite knows where the schools are going to go, there's not enough green space, all those sorts of things, which actually planning is supposed to uh, sort out. And in the accidental city, in the sort of pressure we're seeing today from a perfect storm of large-scale international finance, uh, housing shortage, high value of land, and also the requirement of local authorities to obtain as much Section 106 and uh, SIL uh, from development projects uh, that they're only too willing to uh, provide planning permission. And the scale of that perfect storm is such that even in New York, and they have many of the same pressures, and this is a view of the new super slenders which are going up in New York very quickly, um, which are going up to uh, 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 1,550 feet here. So it's only uh, 200 feet less than the new Freedom Tower, which of course is a lot of that is just a spike on the top. So um, even where you have a system of uh, planning in New York, which has always been uh, pretty well controlled, obviously it's allowed uh, taller buildings than we do generally, but it's well controlled, even there the pressure is such that uh, these towers are bursting out through the top of the system. But, you know, what we need to do is, uh, when we're seeing such uh, significant changes, it is really that uh, it needs to be broad as possible uh, debate about, you know, what sort of city do we want as citizens, but also give us some idea of what the impact of these buildings are. And actually, this is a view of the new cluster looking down towards... Uh, uh, the uh, Vauxhall uh, development area, and actually, I don't think it's too bad. I think it works quite well as a city composition. But actually, um, know, it's a close-run thing. It could have been uh, very much muckier than that. And then uh, another key aspect of uh, the way London is planned, and the other bit that, uh, that sort of not knits into it is uh, where... There is a certain amount of planning, but it is a part of that rich jigsaw which uh, makes up the city and actually differentiates London from al almost any other city. There are, and that is the great estates. And uh, uh, there are a growing number of estates now as people realise the benefits of uh, this sort of single ownership and the way that you can actually manage uh, uh, areas of London more efficiently than the public sector is able to. And I think this is a very interesting shift that is happening at the moment. Now, I put this up here because this, this is one, what I call the incremental estates. This is uh, Paul Raymond, who um, just, uh, he lived in Soho. He ran a number of strip clubs and uh, porn magazines. And uh, he just had a policy of buying things uh, which he didn't have to walk more than five minutes of the office to view before he bought them. So, uh, so it meant that over uh, his career, he actually bought up uh, what was fundamentally uh, a, a large part of Soho. Um, of course, they, they won't tell you how much of Soho they have because uh, they're worried that there'll be you know, one building left in a street which they want and there'll be a ransom on it. So uh, that you, it's difficult to find out precisely what their own issue is. But it, it's a lot. Um, his uh, uh, granddaughter now runs the estate. She's 27. And 
uh, acts rather like uh, Nu in a uh, feudal village, uh, looking after. So it wants to maintain its character, a bit of its raunchiness, you know, not clean it up too much, and uh, uh, very much in the old aristocratic fashion. And that's happened in a very different way than normal. This is a new project that they're doing uh, just off Sharon Cross Road. Um, but of course, the, 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 the real estates were the uh, great estates. This was the uh, Cadogan before it was uh, developed. And uh, this is Grosvenor, Grosvenor Square, uh, uh, sorts of architecture. Again, in that way, they are planned. These areas are planned. Uh, the uh, inspiration of this was the Place de Vosges in Paris. Um, a uh, master plan that actually, although all the buildings have changed, almost the whole of the growth in the master plan is still almost exactly the same as it was uh, when it was uh, first developed. And they do a lot of stuff in terms of uh, uh, improving uh, public space, and they have a greater custodial feel to it uh, than uh, you find in areas where there is multi uh, ownership. Um, and of course, uh, the uh, Crown Estate itself, Crown Estate, with uh, Regent Street and now uh, looking actively at the development of the St. James area, where it doesn't actually own the whole lot, but it owns enough to be able to create some sort of influence in uh, where it's changed. And they also have been key to supporting projects. Uh, I put this in because uh, Peter would have been very cross if I <laughs> left it out. Um, that, uh, the, keen to support uh, changes that uh, have the benefit not only of being for the public good generally, but actually, uh, in the long run, improve the value of their own estate. So it's a win-win situation, uh, which others now recognise. And this is something, uh, this is placemaking at King's Cross, and I think when you go to King's Cross now, you could start to see what is going to happen in the place. And I think it is going to be a great new place for for London, and uh, uh, the whole way that they negotiated, the uh, way that they looked after public spaces, roads with Camden, uh, with Peter Bishop, very sensitively done, but also the idea of uh, looking at a 73 hectare site and looking at a so co coordinated part of the city, but nevertheless creating enough variety to make it uh, interesting and lively place. And you can see that really taking shape now, I can, this, is, this is just a fantastically popular um, uh, piece of city. Uh, it's not over-controlled by Argent. It obviously is the entrance to central St. Martins, but you also find it full of uh, uh, tourists, uh, local community, children playing in the fountains, all sorts of things. It's really great. And you see other areas now which are taking shape, uh, such as Capco Scheme down at Earl's Court. Uh, with master plan by Terry Farrell, this is a very sort of romantic uh, uh, image of it, and one that might not survive uh, totally uh, following the change of uh, leadership in Hammersmith at the uh, recent election, um, partly because of the uh, uh, amount of affordable, I think, promised in some of this, but also there is quite a strong pressure to keep the exhibition hold. And, of course, uh, the Athletes Village itself, which was uh, a was going to be a development by uh, Len Lees. Len Lees, uh, his uh, bosses in uh, uh, Sydney, wouldn't support the fact that they did the development for the uh, Olympics, and therefore they were just project managers, and it was handled and developed uh, by uh, the ODA, uh, which meant that when they were... Uh, getting rid of it, uh, they went to uh, a number of people and the, the winning bid came from Qatari DR, who obviously have uh, a long-term view of their investments, and uh, instead of putting it on the market, uh, they are renting it all out, and it will remain as an estate uh, managed uh, by uh, Qatari and Delancey uh, to create a uh, similar sort of environment to the estates of the uh, 17th, 18th, and 19th century. And then to go back to Canary Wharf, this is Wood Wharf to the uh, east of Canary Wharf itself. Canary Wharf is there. And here you see uh, a plan still on an uh, essentially orthogonal layout, but nevertheless being uh, 
twisted in a rather sort of picturesque English way to uh, create a, a more varied and uh, English environment. But the really fascinating thing about this is that the towers now are residential, because values are much greater in residential. The lower buildings are the offices, because they want to attract the tech market, the sort of people who are used to working in the sort of campuses of uh, Silicon Valley, and uh, a very different sort of environment than the banks in the big uh, floor plates uh, next door. So I wanted to um, end on this because this actually puts the whole thing together and puts it in context. This was a plan um, uh, prepared by the London Society. And um, the London Society was uh, started in 1912 by Edwin Lutchins, uh, uh, Aston Webb, uh, Beresford Pite, uh, and various uh, uh, architects and uh, weren't really planners at the time uh, uh, because there was virtually no planning at all. And they, they produced what was essentially the first London plan, which largely looked at, uh, at, at the way the roads worked. They wanted to change the rail network. They were looking at, even then, airports, uh, uh, channel tunnel links, and so on. And they uh, were the sort of forefathers of uh, what then Abercrombie came up with in uh, 1944. And they were progenitors of the Green Belt. And uh, so, uh, Last November, I was rung up by somebody who said, I'm a member of the London Society. I said, never heard of it. And uh, he said, well, it's about, and he told me a bit of the background that I've just told you. And then he said, well, it's about to be closed down. And I thought, well, that would be a great shame if they closed down, because actually, all the things that they were discussing in uh, uh, 1912 and then after the war with a big uh, report called London of the Future, uh, they really were debating all the issues that we are having to discuss in London at the moment, to do with growth, uh, to do with housing, to do with uh, uh, HS2, uh, Crossrail 2, um, airports, almost everything was on the agenda then and is back on the agenda now, something that needs to be debased, uh, debated and discussed in the widest possible audience. So, uh, uh, so as a result, it wasn't on my plan, but I'm now chairman of uh, London Society and actually spreading out the sort of debates we have at NLA into a much wider forum so that uh, people can discuss what should happen to the city, get some idea of what the shape of London should be and add into that discussion, which is such a key part of the way that uh, decisions are made, a way that actually people outside London can't uh, really understand I uh, remember I had a chat from Des Spiegel who came to interview her about our exhibition about the towers. And I tried to explain to him how decisions happened in London. He just couldn't believe that you could run a city on uh, such this basis of uh, you know, assessing everything on its individual merits, um, adapting plans to suit the changing environment. But it is a method of planning which sometimes is uh, very hard to control, but is one that actually kept London at the top of the tree for 2,000 years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Quite a fantastic flourish to the, um, to the end of our Cities Festival. It's been absolutely fantastic. And what a great privilege to have Peter here, who's given us such a historic overview of how London has developed and also some of the key issues that are emerging, which is really fantastic and, and fantastic to hear. So I'm going to hand over briefly to Zoe, and she's going to be sharing some questions. Fantastic. Um, yes, thanks again for attending um, the week-long festival. Um, lots of activity on the Twitter and lots of debate as well. And um, as you can see from Peter's presentation, um, cities have gone through dramatic changes, London itself having so much incremental change and almost you know, accidents which have actually worked in its favour. Um, so it'd be great to hear from you any sort of viewpoints or, or issues that you would like to um, ask Peter. Yes. Uh, I have heard on the grapevine that whenever there's a discussion about tall buildings, there's very little engagement with and guidance upon embedding sustainable and sustainability into the design. So that's one area for me that I know what I understand is 
what I understand is that Kate wrote a guide, but actually that guide means updating or something, and that is not really embedded, you know, so the next step appears to be maybe embedding more sustainability into that guidance on how to design toward loading. So that's one thing, your view, and what the London Society can do that, in terms of ensuring that tall buildings are actually designed and built in a sustainable way. And I have a second observation, which is that when I look at that cluster of buildings together, if I was, I just wonder also in terms of design, how much well-being and health and comfort is actually considered for the people in that building. Because if, you're, if I look at them from here, they're very close together. So actually one building might overshadow another building. So they don't get as much access to daylight. So it's sort of like impact on daylight design. Because you said, oh, they look neat together. Yeah, but in terms of being inside them, I don't know how much is actually considered there. So yeah, daylight, you are health and well-being, and so on. It, it just seems to me that I'm not convinced that at the moment that that's really, if you took a look at the KPIs for tall building design, the things I've raised is really brilliant. What should you use? And what, can, what can happen, or what can you see going? Well, I, I mean, I guess the issue to do with sustainability of tall buildings is quite a complex one because actually, uh, fundamentally, tall buildings are quite unsustainable in that they do, uh, they're a lot more difficult and more expensive and more energy consuming to build in the first place. They actually take more energy to uh, uh, run because you need lifts and all sorts of other controls that you don't need in a bungalow. Uh, that being said, uh, in terms of other issues like CO2 emissions, then it, it, it is generally seen to be uh, more efficient and the fundamental uh, graph is used by uh, Richard Rogers uh, in Compact City and in the um, Urban Task Force report is you know, showing that cities like Shanghai, Hong Kong have the largest, uh, 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 smallest CO2 emissions and uh, Los Angeles and uh, sprawling cities have the greatest. So uh, there's, there's quite a lot of, um, uh, you know, if you take them on their own, they're not very sustainable. They, there were plans when uh, Ken Livingston required, um, I, can't, I can't remember what the precise percentage was of renewables in all development. Um, everyone put their little uh, windmills on the top and uh, none of them uh, seem to contribute and the strata doesn't use theirs because it doesn't produce any energy or because it makes a noise. Nobody's quite sure, but even the Vauxhall tower that I showed had a helical one on the top and that it being removed to not be used. So uh, there was an attempt to approve it, but that all seemed to have gone by the wayside. And to a certain extent, I think there's a difference also in tall buildings that for offices and uh, residential uh, that uh, I don't think we've quite uh, uh, got to grips with yet. And things like the Vauxhall tower is essentially a glass building, whereas you see a lot of more uh, more recent designs for tall buildings having uh, fewer windows, uh, greater solid areas on the facade. I, I mean, to some extent, in terms of well-being, I think that uh, clearly there are a certain amount of uh, uh, protection of daylight uh, uh, through uh, planning and regulation, which does um, provide some modicum of uh, um, health, healthy living and. That, of course, is one of the reasons why uh, areas like uh, South Key are so difficult, because unless you plan it all in one go, with developers just trying to put up their own buildings designed to maximise their own uh, return uh, without looking at it as a whole, then uh, somebody's going to lose out because the one next door won't be able to build uh, a, a, a building of any scale because of exactly those issues. So, I mean, to a certain extent, um, I, I would say that there, there, are, there are issues not just with tall buildings at the moment, but uh, generally about densification in London. Yeah. It's something that we're not um, terribly used to or good at, and I think that's something we still need to um, uh, have some experience in. And to a certain extent, you, it's quite interesting how you see that uh, practices who have now I had a lot of experience out in the Far East, for instance, are actually doing quite a lot of work here, not just because uh, they have a lot of Chinese investors, but also because of their understanding of denser, more, um, uh, and generally higher uh, living environments. And I have to say, when, when, when I look at uh, 
things like nine elms and the density of nine elms, I think uh, uh, it, it's very hard to quite uh, get a feel of what the quality of life at uh, even at ground level is going to be. Thank you. Can I jump in on that? Because this isn't a way to deal with the debate, and I'm sure in parts of your debates you've already had it. The but once we're shorthand, Peter Heath or Yang Gill, ground up view about the ground plane. You enthusiastically talked about the ground plane, cycling, pedestrian, priority, and so on. Um, and of course, it's massively influenced by microclimate effects, which are phenomenally scientifically complex, even with wind tunnel analysis on single towers or small groups of towers, let alone what I would call not clusters, they should be called walls of towers. And you know your latest visuals are showing exactly that. And it's all well and good talking about the thing as object of sustainability. We all work in this lousy tower, I have to say, in sustainable mm -hmm. terms. The amount of wasted time alone in fire evacuation, sports alarms, and others uh, is ridiculously inefficient. The air conditioning you're witnessing in air quality is appalling. Mm -hmm. And the maintenance regularity on it, because it's an old system, has to be enormous. So there's a lot of new, new nonsense. But the ground level, the wind effects around the base of this tower in the well managed region place. Uh, in most times of the year, rather than this particularly warm summer period, means that it's just not pleasant. I mean, really not pleasant, merging on the incredibly unpleasant. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the great opportunity. And looking, what are we looking south today? West. Westminster has had an eight story maximum rough informal policy for buildings uh, as a planning authority since 1947 and before. And what a difference it is to the quality of street, life, amenity, flexibility, spatial quality of its historic squares and spaces. By comparison with the City of London narrow rebuilding of very high blocks on narrow street and non-grid streets. And I think we can quite easily understand the enthusiasm and the commercial pressures in the city and the separate pressures that you've got down very clearly in Mary Wolf and the rebuilding there and the difference in the city of Westminster and celebrate and protect them in their own zones as the difference between London and every other world city. And that my view is that we could live, it's like good architecture and bad architecture and massively eclectic variations of themes over the ages. Well, you know, each in their time has a role to play in the enjoyment of the difference of a great city commissioning space and place and architecture. So I think, to me, you know, getting obsessed with design of object buildings alone is as wrong as only looking at groups of building strategy or only looking at the fabric design rather than the human ground level. Was that a question? Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm going to call a statement. Yeah, long statement. But I mean, the ground plane, you know, the, the, the you know, Yang Gill's film the other week we were watching, Cuban Scale, I mean, the, he, he doesn't like tall buildings in the modernist era full stop because he behaviorally has observed the behavior difference with human beings and their activity levels yeah. and put it into survey. Now, you know, no survey is, is comprehensive or definitive until it's made completely scientific. So two identical cities, one built one way, one I guess it's a good time to what we said together. It, the thing is that if we think about this building, there's something about Roma accountability to the occupant, and there's something about we pay a certain amount of money and we get a service back. But it never, they, like if you're on a train, you talk about a customer experience. If you're traveling on the train, you design for that. And I know we're meant to design for well being and confidence. But what I guess what I'm putting back is that if tall buildings are going to be designed, I think that one of the parameters between us is that well-being has to be on the table, of the people in it, because we can't sacrifice the human experience. Do you think essentially that there's a way that they can be better managed than just using tall buildings? Does there need to be more? But it's, it's not, that's just not just management. It's also mm. design. It's like, but it is built in, like what you're saying there. It's daylight and it's spacing, but it's density. It's that thing that London is so dense. It's one yes, but I think, uh, the, as, as I was saying, one of the issues about tall buildings is that there are huge pressures in terms of growth and 
investment uh. zone on London, and that uh, this is actually making it very hard for our current system to, I think, cope in the sort of quality that you're talking about and quality that I think it needs, which is why you need to look at some better system of yeah. dealing with this in terms of planning and that would uh, bring in the sorts of issues you talk about. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm not a, a, a total um, supporter of everything Jan uh, says. I, I, I support his ideas about, uh, uh, generally, about uh, places uh, being for people, um, but uh, I think there are areas in, in the world that I feel very comfortable with tall buildings and I actually like them and enjoy them and feel quite healthy in them. So, I think it is, it's not um, necessarily the case a bad thing. And uh, I had an argument with him not long ago about Norman Foster's proposals for building cycleways on uh, railway lines. Uh, he, said, he said, this isn't what cycling is all about. And of course, it's not, not in Copenhagen, which is a, uh, a population of uh, 450,000 people or something. You know, it's like the yeah. size of Ealing. Yeah, it depends how far out you go, um, but it's small, and uh, you, know, you don't have people commuting in the same way that you do in London, which is a key part of the London cycling habit. I think we have a question at the back there, actually. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that came through in your uh, presentation was that a lot of these projects are very much driven by the demands of uh, the modern economy, and also that they tend to exposed to some of the biggest problems associated with those economies. The two that jump to mind are inequality and uh, this boom and bust cycle that we've had to see over the years. And just looking at the examples of maybe in New York in the 1920s when those skyscrapers were built, they had to be built through a recession. They were often built with labor that wasn't very well represented. Um, we now see that in areas like Dubai as well. Uh, my family lived in Bangkok for a while and I can remember seeing half-finished tall buildings from the late 90s economic recession. Uh, and given that those two trends seem to be coming ever more amplified, that is the problem of inequality and the problem of instability in, at the macroeconomic level, I wonder if those are affecting the way people think about how you plan for large buildings, at least on the institutional side. Mm. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I think people are aware of that, but I'm, I'm not sure they uh, take enough notice, uh, partly because people's memories are so terribly short, really. I think that's what happens, because, um, as you say, it's, um, with tall buildings, it's been happening since the 1930s, and actually probably before in Chicago, but uh, that uh, the, the planning and, and their construction, everything, you know, they, they take uh, 15 years or so to happen in London, and. Uh, quicker in other places, but then that also reflects quicker cycles in, often. But uh, almost every tall building that you uh, go into has gone through that sort of period in those uh, <coughs> economies which uh, maybe aren't quite so robust. You say they just stop work and leave the site and leave it empty. Um, here we finish the building and uh, you don't see that it's empty quite so much, but it still remains empty for quite a long time. Uh, but I think that you'll find that there are many people um, starting to plan taller buildings once the economy starts to pick up again, as uh, there were that uh, left off at the beginning of the recession. Partly because, um, as I said, I think mem memories, uh, uh, even corporate memories, are so short that they feel that the next one's not going to be the same. Okay. Um, I'm Sorry, we're going to have to. Okay. Yes. Yes, um, I'm afraid we've run out of time, but um, obviously this uh, presentation will be available online, and if there are any further questions, I'm sure Peter will be happy to answer them. Thank you very Good. much, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Never enough meeting rooms. Thank you. 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 Thank you.